Pete, let's go back to the very beginning. Mm-hmm. When did these two fellows, Lennon and McCartney, arrive in your life? Uh, that would be 1959, early 1959. All because uh, my mother wanted to open a club called the Casbah, okay, in West Derby Village. And uh, the two people who were initially came over to see my mother, Mona, uh, were George Harrison and Ken Brown, okay. And they were playing in a band called the Legio Quartet, who she wanted to open the club. That was the original plan. But anyway, when George and uh, Ken came over, uh, they basically explained to Mona that um, that wasn't going to happen, right? So George turned around and said, but I happen to know a couple of friends who aren't doing anything at the present moment. And uh, they might be interested, you know, because she did explain to them it is going to be a residency. And to them, residencies were like gold in those days. So she said, bring them down. Simple as that. Lo and behold, the next day, I'm there with Mo. George walks around the corner, Ken walks around the corner, Lennon and McCartney appear, okay. George introduces them, Mo, John, Paul, Mo. The deal was struck, you know, they were gonna open the club on August the 29th. This is 1959 we're talking about. And they turned around and said, can we go and have a look at it? See what we're gonna be playing. And she said, by all means. She gave him the royal tour. You know, there was still a lot of work to be done and everything. But they were very impressed with it. You know, she said, this is where you're going to be playing, which is in the middle chamber, as we allude to these days. And uh, they turned around and said, well, we can see there's some work which needs doing. And we'd be only too pleased to help. Um, so that's how my involvement with John and Paul came about. You know, the next thing I knew, they were decorating the club. You know, um, they had a couple of practices down there. And then as the um, opening night approached, other members came, you know, the entourage, Cynthia, Stu, Dot, you know, the usual. And um, before we knew it, opening night was there. And Mo turned around and said, oh, by the way, what do you call yourselves? So John turned around and said, well, we used to be called the Quarrymen. She said, that's fine. That'll do me. Quarrymen opened. But the lineup was John George and Paul and Ken Brown. No drummer, just four guitars. Wow. Mm-hmm. Isn't it also true that whilst decorating the Casbah, Lennon got mixed up between Matt and Gloss? Yes, yes, yes. It cost, uh, cost more for you, Bob, but uh, we, managed to <laughs> we managed to sort it out. Basically what had happened... Um, Mo turned around and said to John, you know, I want some decorations on the wall, Aztec figures on the ceiling, okay. So he says, listens to Mo, right, fine, this, this, that, and the other. When Mo came down again, you know, all of a sudden it was the pop-bellied squirrelies and, you know, the usual thing that John used to get up to. And uh, Mo's looking at the colour. And it's not the colour that she's turned around and said. And then she looks at the texture. And she turned around and said, what the hell have you done? You know, so he turned around and said, well, you wanted me to paint the seal? And she said, but that's not how I want you to paint the seal. So um, she basically turned around and said, you're going to have to do a repaint. Okay, so it was decided there and then, this is the paint you're going to use, and this is what I want. Okay, so beneath... The Casbah layers, okay, there's a couple of John's pop elite figures up there, amongst the other stuff which hasn't changed, you know, but um, it was quite horrendous because we were on a pretty tight time scale, you know, so for a ceiling to be sort of having to be redone again, you know, with the short scale, Mo was in panic mode. What have you done? What have you done? But uh, she took it in good faith. She only slapped him twice and, uh, you know, off, off they went, you know, but Fortunately, you know, all came good in the end. All came good in the end. What about yourself and the band coming about? Is, I mean, is, there, a, is there a pre-Beatles band for Pete Best? Or what, what was that you were... No, uh, yeah, there was. Um, I had a band called the Blackjacks, which evolved because, as history portrays now, the, the first stint of the Beatles as the Quarrymen, OK, lasted about eight weeks, something like that. And then there was a disagreement over money, you know, that magic word money 
And th that all came about because Ken Brown, this particular night, wasn't up to playing. So Mo turned around and said in a generosity, even though Ken's not playing, he was helping out in the club. I think he was sitting behind the till, you know, taking membership money and that type of stuff. And uh, she turned around and explained to the other three, you know, I'll give Ken's share to... Uh, sorry, I'll give Ken's share to Ken and not amongst the three of you. So they didn't like that. It was like, no, we want Ken's share. OK, I think it was only something like five shillings, you know. A lot of money in those days, mind you, when you think back about it. And uh, she was adamant. She turned around and said, no, Ken is getting paid. Of course, the ultimatum was, we ain't playing here anymore. Right, so that left Mo in a bit of a quandary. Because by this time, um, she hadn't started to bring in Rory Storm and she hadn't started to bring in Derry. So it was still one band. And... Uh, Ken turned around and said, I'd always promised Mo, regardless of what happened, Ken Brown, that I will have a band for her, right? So he'd seen me banging pots and pans and the table and everything like that. And he turned around and said, fancy starting a, a band, Pete? So I said, yeah, you know, fine. He said, you can be the drummer. So I said, OK, fair enough. So I happened to know a couple of school friends, Chaz and Billy, Chaz Newby, who had a very short spell with the... Uh, the Beatles, um, when we first came back from Germany, and Bill Barlow, who was my lead guitarist. Um, I'd seen him at school through the skiffle days and all that. And uh, I put the deal to them. I basically turned around and said, I'm going to form a band, Ken and myself. And he said, yeah, sounds good. Bit of a laugh, nothing serious. So I went back to Ken and turned around and said, yeah, they, they agree. I said, there's only one problem, no Ken. I said, I haven't got any drums. Right. So uh, he looked at me and he turned around and said, well, do you think you can sort that out? So I said, got an idea, right? Off I went to Mo and Dad and, uh, you know, turned around and said, we're going to start a band, but there's only one problem, I need drums, OK? So uh, she turned around and said, well, first of all, what we'll do, we'll get you a snare drum and a cymbal, OK? So some of the early photographs you see of me, I've got a cymbal and a snare drum, you know, doing my Gene Krupa pose on that, right? And um, that's how it started. We started practicing, you know. Then I escalated to a, a full drum kit, you know, which I got from Rushworths. My famous Sky Blue Premier kit, okay, with the 22, 24-inch bass drum, you know. And uh, that was it. I had the drums, you know, we called ourselves the Blackjacks. We played the Casbah, you know, we, we became like a bit of a resonant band there for a while. Till Mo brought the, the other bands in who were a damn sight lot better than us, you know. And uh, we, we got a pretty good following in around Liverpool, you know, we did weddings and dance halls and the usual stuff that was going on. Um, so that was my pre-era, and then I was still happily banging the skins with my little band, and I got that phone call from Paul McCartney, which more or less changed my life. When when Paul rang you, mm. um, and I, I mean, I'm not saying this to put the guy down, because obviously, A, he's, he's no longer with us, and B, it, it's turned out he would have been the world's, probably one of the greatest artists anyway, yeah. had he survived. Did it bother you, you you were joining the band that had a bass player who couldn't actually really play bass guitar? No, because what I'd heard about them, I mean, they, they, to me this is all hearsay. I mean, you know, the, the, I'm one of the guys who defends you emphatically over, you know, playing bass. Um, I know the story behind it. I mean, he was persuaded to buy the bass in the Casbah, right? Um, you know, John and Paul. And he was sitting there, he'd won John Moore's exhibition, he got his 50 quid and they coerced him and turned around and said, you want to play bass for the Beatles? And he said, I can't play bass. He said, we'll teach you, right? So by the time I joined up with him again, she was a stalwart part of the band, okay? Um, when I got the offer to join, that was the line-up uh, because uh, the drummer Tommy had left after he'd done the tour with Johnny Gentle in Scotland. Um, he'd come back and he'd had a bust up with John. And uh, he turned around and said, no, 
you know, and off he disappeared back to Garston Bottle Works and got on his forklift, lift and that was it, the last we saw of him. And uh, I got the phone call, so of course when I went down, and I was a little bit, I suppose, bemused that they wanted me to audition, you know, because they'd seen me playing at the Casbah. Um, but it was a case of, no, we want you to audition, right, so... I went with my brother Rory, threw me drums in a taxi, went to the Y Van Club, which later became the Blue Angel, and uh, popped them up. And, you know, they all eventually came in. Paul was last as usual. And uh, we blasted off about six numbers, you know, just house standards, Ramrod, 12 Bar Boogie, um, some of Chuck Berry's, you know, um, Johnny, and the, Johnny Kidd and the Pirates shaking all over. Stuff that we were playing day in and day out, you know. No original material at that time. And uh, it lasted about 10, 15 minutes. They went away in a corner, a little bit of a huddle. They sounded great to me, you know. Listening to it, the whole little band sounded great, you know. And uh, they came back, and as they came back, Alan Williams came in. And uh, they turned around and said, Alan, meet the new drummer. Right, so I went over, you know, even though I knew Alan, you know, from the Casbah I'd been down, I'd seen him in the distance, you know, facing the mad crowd, you know, and it was a little bit like, what's he doing down here? And uh, he'd been down there clocking me, you know, so uh, he knew what it was about, so it, uh, he turned around and said, um, the reason for the audition piece, right, um, we knew what your capabilities were as regards a drummer, he said, but... Uh, we had to audition you, right? We were worried that you may ask for more money, okay? So I said, well, I haven't asked for any money at the moment. <laughs> so he said, yes, that's a good point, though. So it was very much a case of, uh, you know, at that stage, it was like whatever we earn gets split five ways, you know, with Alan's so-called percentage taken out, if and when he ever got it. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, that's the way we worked, you know. A couple of days after that, we did one run through at the um, the Jacaranda, you know, famous photograph holding the the mic on the broomsticks, Dot and Cindy, like you know, loyal fans. And uh, we did that, and that was our practice. And a couple of days after that, we were on our way to Hamburg. Which I've got to ask you about Hamburg because surely for five lads from. Say you walk down to somebody could told that at your age is as young as you were, yeah, yeah. you're going to play Hamburg. Was it not a bit like being told you've got a book in on Mars to some degree? <laughs> was initially, yeah. I mean, even when Paul turned around and said, you know, uh, we've got Hamburg, and I was like, huh? You know, I'd heard about it, but it was like, God, we're actually going there, you know. Um, and of course, as history portrays now, uh, it was like, you know, I think our. Uh, Recognition that Hamburg was, you know, Liverpool had been bombed, Hamburg had been bombed. Hamburg was a port, Liverpool's a port. We're Scousers, they're Hamburgers, right? Um, so we got over there. And then, of course, it was just like chalk and cheese, you know, compared to what was going on in Liverpool at that time. You know, the pubs closing at 10 o'clock and all that kind of stuff, licensing hours. Um, and, you know, neon lights in Liverpool at that stage were like, you know, if there ever were any. Um, but of course, when we got to Hamburg and we had the Reaper Barn strip, right? The whole approach down to the Grocer Fry right, where we ended up playing. Just totally, you know, it was like Blackpool prom to us. You know, Blackpool lights with music. And all the other sundries which were there as well, you know, the call girls and, you know, the bars that were open 24 hours. But it was a, a culture shock to us, you know, but it was a great culture shock because it was such an exciting trip, you know, the whole thing, smuggled in, wrong papers, <laughs> the whole episode. And then getting to Hamburg, um, you know, seeing the Reaper Barn, the Grocer Fry out for the first time, dashing into the Kaiser Keller, seeing Derry and the seniors there, you know, brilliant band, you know, Derry, brilliant singer, Howie on sax, absolutely, you know. I'd seen them at the Casbah because they were one of the house bands at the Casbah. And, uh, you know, we dashed into the Kaiser Keller down the steps thinking, this is where we're going to play. So we met Bruno Koschmeider, 
And he basically turned around and said, yes, 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 you are the Beatles from Liverpool. Yes, 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 yes. No, you're not playing here, right? <laughs> but follow me. So off we went, you know, the five of us, Alan, Beryl, all the Sunday, whoever had been in the, in the van with us, we all trooped off. And as the gross fry for people who don't know, the top end of it's very neon lit, okay, and, you know, a lot of action going on. And we're walking down, and of course, as we're walking down, it's getting darker and dimmer and quieter. Until <laughs> so we came to this, I suppose you could call it a club, okay. And uh, we went in, and it was nothing compared to the Kaiser Keller. No atmosphere. Place was different totally in decoration. You know, it was like he walked in, it was like, ugh. Um, two people in there. A couple of guys up loud and, you know, who's going to buy the next beer, you know. And Kashmir turns around to us and quite proudly goes, this is where you're going to play, right? And I want you to make it into another Kaiser killer. That was the challenge we had. So being five scousers from Liverpool, we said, took that one on the chin. We said, fine, you know, when do we start? He said, tomorrow, right? So he said, what time do we start at? He said seven, because we didn't know how long we were going to be playing. We just knew we were getting 15 quid a week. Um, so Alan kept that quiet from seeing you, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we turned around and said, uh, seven o'clock start, yeah. I said, what time do we finish? And he said, two o'clock. On weekdays. Three o'clock at the weekend. So it's like non-stop. No, you can have 15 minutes off every hour. Right, so it's like we looked at Alan, Alan put his head down, sort of turned around and you know, shook it and it was like, Well, I was gonna get round to telling you guys, getting round to telling you. So that was another shock that we had, and then we turned around and said, Okay, rock and roll, this is what we're here about. And uh, off off we went, we turned around and said, Where are we staying? <laughs> Follow me. So we went over the road to the back of the Bambi Kino, which is a second-rate cinema that Kashmir their own. Used to put strippers on there and B-movies and all the other bits and pieces. You know, we used to slink in through the back door, watch the strippers, you know, until we got fed up with them. And then we found out there were better strippers up the street, you know, so we used to go up there. And uh, he turned around and said, this is where you're going to stay, you know. So we went through this back door, corridor going up, which is basically the back of the cinema, right? We can see a light at the end of the, the corridor, right? Basically next to the urinals, you know, the, me the men's bogs. Um, so we're heading for that, right? Uh, so we get there, we get in there, there's one electric lamp bulb hanging down, right? Three beds, right? So we were the last two in Paul and myself, so we were the unlucky ones. So John's grabbed his camp bed, George's grabbed his couch, Steve's grabbed whatever other bed was going there. So we turned around and said, to cost me the way we sleeping. So he said, oh, you passed it. You know, so we said, we, we didn't see anything on the way up. So he said, oh, yeah, 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 come with me, you know. So we went back down again. It was like a coal bunker with a wall split in the middle with a, a hole knocked out in the middle of the wall, right, which was the, our communication to one another. And what we alleged to this day was supposed to be beds, right? And he turned around and said, this is where, you know, Paul and yourself are going to sleep. So we turned around and said, what about lights, electricity? He said, there is none, you know. So... We said, fine, okay. Shot up the corridor again to Alan. Alan, you know, what are you... Oh, it's only temporary, lads, it's only temporary. Well, that temporary lasted about four months, right? Until <laughs> we moved to the top ten. And that was a, a different story altogether. So that initial baptism of fire, the excitement and then the dismay and then the adrenaline rush and then, you know... Uh, actually being told you're going to make it into another Kaiser killer, you know, and we asked him how many people come here, and he said none, you know. But uh, like everything else, um, 
we were rock and rollers. We got stuck in. Um, the noise evolved from the club. Um, word got out on the, on the grocer fry height. The grocer fry height stripped. There was another band from Liverpool now uh, called the Beatles. Not the Silver Beatles, which we'd been billed as, you know, which is another story because when we got there, we were already calling ourselves the Beatles, right? But we're billed as the Silver Beatles, right? So John, to his greatest taste, right, turned around and said, got a black marker or something out of his pocket. And this billboard that had us up, uh, just a sign, no glass over it or anything like that. The Silver Beatles from Liverpool, or words to that effect. And he just scratched silver out completely. You know, when he turned around and said, we're the Beatles. Okay, not the Silver Beatles, we're the Beatles. And uh, from there on in, in Hamburg, you know, we were the Beatles or the Farouk Beatles or Big Knack Beatles, whatever way you wanted to call it. Um, and that was our baptism to fire. Word got out on the street, there was another band, they're pretty good. Um, and people came to see us. But unfortunately, what we didn't realise, Koshmida was comparing us with Derry. And you see, Derry was little richer than personified. All over the stage, you know, how he with his sax and everything. The band was vibrant, you know, Derry was the front man, he kept everything ticking over. We were quite stoic. You know, we were standing there playing drums and, you know, like, wooden statues, you know, singing. The only saving grace was the repertoire we had, which involved harmonies and that. So Kashmir came up one night and he did listen to us and he said, yeah, 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 the music's good, the music's good. He said, but um, you must mock Xiao, mock Xiao, you know, so like mock Xiao. He said, yes, yes, yes. Derry, Derry, he jumps around, this, this, that and the other. So by this time he'd been there about a week. So we turned around to one another and said, OK, we'll bloody well mock Xiao, right? So it was just like every stupid damn thing we could think of. But it became our trademark, right? We used to stamp our feet. Um, you know, when the beat came along, emphasise the beat. Um, uh, John, in what they say, would jump off the piano, right? Split his kecks every night. You know, Mutti would sold them up in the box while we were having a 15-minute break. Uh, oh, crazy, you know, mock fights on stage, jump off the stage, pretend to fight with the audience, go and split someone up who's dancing, dance with the girlfriend. The crowd loved it. OK, so it was basically a case. Kashmir, there was over the moon. He's got the Beatles acting like nutters on stage. <laughs> the crowds are coming to the Casba, uh, to the Indra. He was rubbing his hands. OK, go and see Derry at the Kaiser Keller. They'd finish, they'd run down the road to the, the Indra, see us, we'd finish, they'd run back up, same crowd, milling backwards and forwards. Kashmir's rubbing his hands, oh, great. So we went over there one night and the place was closed. And uh, <laughs> we didn't know about it, but apparently um, the uh, main complaints, there was an old lady lived upstairs, okay. And as we got louder and more dramatic and the crowds had swelled and, you know, the noise got louder and louder and louder, she'd complained to the police. We didn't know it at the time. But allegedly the police had had words with Kashmir there and Kashmir had turned around and said, oh, yeah, 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 fine, I'll, I'll take care of it. He never did, right? So the police in their wisdom turned around and said, we're closing it. So that's how we ended up playing the Kaiser Killer. With uh, with Terry, the Indra closed. Um, Kashmina needed to put us somewhere, so he said, "You're playing the Kaiser Keller, okay? You will alternate with Derry and the Seniors." So the Kaiser Keller became Derry and the Seniors and the Beatles, till Derry and the Seniors went home. Presumably, playing for seven, eight hours <coughs> a day yeah, yeah. at the weekends must do a hell of a lot for your bonding together <coughs> as a great rock and roll band. Very much so. We didn't realise it at the time, to be quite honest. Um, but it was just like, <clears throat> I suppose you could turn around and say seven hours practice every night. You know, we'd never done that before. I don't think many bands in Liverpool had that facility anyway to, to perform like that. So we went from being a 
be quite honest, a very mediocre rock and roll band. Okay. To this tight, frenetic, wild, savage sounding Beatles. You know, a great rock band. And this was because of the playing relentlessly every night. The show developed, our persona developed, our charisma as a band developed, the showmanship developed within, the vocals became stronger. So everything was working for us. So as I remember uh, Howie, um, when he went back home to Liverpool and he played the Casper and he spoke to Mo and he turned around and said, Mo, he said, when the Beatles come back home again, he said, you won't recognise them. He said, they are absolutely brilliant. He said, watch out, you know. And that was praise from the man himself, you know. I mean, it was most probably allegedly number one in Liverpool at that time. And uh, he said, he said, I've seen them grow, right? And of course, true to his word, when we came back to Liverpool, that first night we played, which was at the Casbah, believe it or not, it was unbelievable. You know, the kids didn't know what had hit them. It was like the whole persona was there. You know, our leathers, our long hair. If you look at it now, it's, you know, it's long, but not by comparison to today or what it went through later on. Um, but, you know, the black T-shirts, the cowie boots, the leather jackets, um, that defiant arrogance that we developed over there. And, of course, this powerhouse sound, you know. And uh, it just basically captivated the kids in Liverpool. So basically overnight from the Casbah, Beatles with the name on the street, you know, everyone wanted them. Now your Hamburg travels were cut short when they found out George's real age, weren't you? Sure, sure. So yeah, yeah. I believe there's a little story as well regarding something you and Paul did that you just thought was hijinks and went a lot further basically. <laughs> well we do to us it was hijinks at that time, but we didn't realise that we'd have upset Koshmida that much. Okay. Because as he turns around and says, we've turned around and said, we've got a better deal, and this is the way we look at it, okay? And it, it's it's basically, again, it's money orientated and it's a better club, right? We knew that Tony Sheridan was playing around the corner at the top 10 club, on the Reaper Barn, okay? Which most probably at that time was regarded the number one club in Hamburg. Tony was playing there, who was an idol to us, we'd seen him on Oh Boy, and when we found out he was playing around the corner, there's a TV star playing, and, you know, so we used to run around the corner and watch him. And of course, we'd sit there and, you know, laid back, you know, and our letters looking at him like that. We're the Beatles, you know, we're around the corner. And of course, Tony recognised us eventually. Um, he came over and the, the bond grew between us. And what transpired was Echo on had heard about the Beatles at the Kaiser Keller and thought it'd be great so with the Beatles and Sheridan together in his club. So he's got the two biggest straws in Hamburg together under one roof. And um, he did that. He offered us more money, uh, better living accommodations, <laughs> uh, which had a lot to do with it as well. Um, and just the whole deal was great to us at that time. You know, better mics, everything. You know, the club we went in, loved the club atmosphere in the club the way it was run so we said yeah and when we went back and told Kashmir you know he defiantly turned around and said well if you move to the top 10 you will never play Hamburg again and we basically turned around and said we're the Beatles you know up you because um, that's how we'd grown in stature you know it was like no you don't walk over us anymore we're the Beatles you know and um you know, we went, little did we know, he meant that we weren't going to play Hamburg anymore. So all of a sudden, mysteriously, George suddenly gets picked up by the aliens, Politei, and sent home for being underage, couldn't play after 10 o'clock, which is the Ausweiss. All kind of stuff like that, you know. Um, just make it really hard for the band to perform. And then when we moved to the top 10 club, the, the night we were there, Paul and I were still in the black holes of Calcutta, right? The, you know, the cold bunkers at the back of the Bambikino. And uh, we went to get our stuff. As I've said before, no lights, right? Um, so we 
had condoms on us, okay, we stuck the condoms out, stuck them on the wall, lit them, they spluttered, okay. No intentions of burning the damn cinema down, you know, it just gave us enough light to basically throw what meagre belongings we had after four months there, you know, left to throw it in a suitcase and disappear off to the top ten. Don't know more about the fact that it had charred the world, you know, it was just like fine, I hadn't done any damage, it was out, you know, and off we popped. Because we played the top ten, the next morning we wake up. Well, we didn't wake up, we got woken up uh, by two policemen right, from the David Strauss police station. Um, dragged off down there, didn't know why. Um, basically when we got there, they basically turned around and said, well, yes, we're, we're charging you, there's a charge against you that you've attempted to burn the Bambi Kino down. So we turned around and said, what? So he turned around and said, yes, Bruno Koshmir has turned around and said that you, Herr McCartney, and Herr Best have tried to bend the Bambi Kino down. So we turned around and said, well, that's a load of BS, that. Stu was there with Astrid um, because he'd seen what had gone on. Astrid, even though we could, you know, speak German, OK, uh, trying to prove yourself to the German police, Astrid came down and she... You know, I think Jürgen was with them as well. And she basically sort of coerced with the police, but they were adamant. It was like, no, you're going home. What we didn't realise um, was that we were going to be deported, but we were going to spend time in Hamburg jail. Got in the police cars. Next thing we see, these massive grey gates with spikes on them. Hamburg jail, Hamburg prison. Okay, where all the heavy offenders go on every night. Paul and I are wheeled into there, right? Uh, upstairs, um, second floor or third floor or something like that. And uh, we're put in a cell, you know, the proper prison cell with bars, and, you know, and everything. And a window in the wall, and we're looking out, and it's looking into a courtyard where there's you know, prisoners walking around, the usual, you know, typical, I suppose you could turn around and say, pr prison scene, you know, the warders there with all that. And we basically looked at one of them and turned around and said, this is the end of Paul and Pete, no one's going to see us, we can't get word out, you know, we're banged up in Amberg jail. Oh my God, right, panic set in, right. Anyway, we, we sort of came to terms with the idea. Uh, saying that's the best thing we can do. We'd been up since crack of dawn, hardly any sleep, you know, and the grill and everything else. There were, there were beds in there or bunks in there. And we just basically laid on the bunks, right, with our shoes on. Well, the next thing was this warder comes hurtling in, right? You know, God knows what he was yelling at us, like, but it sounded nasty anyway. <laughs> Uh, but the top and bottom of it was, you can't lie on the bunk with your shoes on, right? So we had to take our shoes off, right? And then the next thing was, uh, they came back in again, been in there about three or four hours, you know, started to get pretty dark, because uh, it was December, uh, end of November, December. And the next thing we knew, we were on our way to the airport, uh, getting flown home, courtesy the German government but only to London, <laughs> right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So when we landed in London at the airport, uh, we tried to speak to the British Embassy, we, we couldn't. Uh, we'd done a runner to try and phone them. We'd been yanked out and basically stuck on this plane like convicts, you know, because um, you can imagine sitting on this plane, you know, police stuff was in there. We're still basically in leather jackets or jeans or whatever we'd woke up in unshaven, looked like criminals, to be quite honest. And as I went on the plane, sort of looking at us, going, look at them, you know, states of those guys. Anyway, we got off to London, um, Heathrow, and we suddenly realised that we had to get home. We had to get from Heathrow back to Liverpool. Um, so I made a couple of phone calls to Mona. Um, she turned around and said, sort it out with them because in those days you could give your name in and they'd balance it up afterwards and Paul did the same with his dad so that we ended up we managed to get the train so 
lo and behold, completely out the blue, unexpectedly, apart from the fact that we were supposed to be in Germany. You know, overnight, I'm knocking at the door in the early hours of the morning, and Paul's doing the same with, you know, uh, Mr McCartney, and, um, you know, that was our welcome back to Liverpool, you know, so <laughs> the first thing Mo asked me, she said, now, I said, what happened? I said, it's a long story, Mo. I'll get round to it eventually, you know, which we did, you know. Just just moving forward a bit, when you guys went back to Germany, you got a record deal as a backing band for Tommy Shredder mm -hmm. to do this single. At the time, because obviously this is just part of your natural progression <coughs> of the other band, how special did that seem? Oh, God. Marvellous. You know, I, I, you couldn't sum up how we felt, to be quite honest, you know. So actually turn around and get told by Peter Eckhorn that the biggest record producer in Germany is coming to watch the band. I bird camp with, you know, Wunderland by Nacht. And came and watched a couple of nights, you know, and asked, requested a couple of songs, which in fact ended up being on the albums and parts of the releases. Um, and then to basically have a conversation with him where he turns around and says, I want to sign you. Like, this is, we thought, Polydor, the biggest label in, it could have been the biggest label in the world for all we could, you know, and it was just like, common sense went out the window, to be quite honest. Um, it was very much a case of, yeah, where do we sign? Where do we sign? What are, what are we signing for? Et cetera, et cetera. And it was only afterwards when we recorded, we, we realised that we were getting paid a session fee and, you know, we'd had the bums rush. <laughs> that was it. Um, so, you know, the consequences that we were supposed to go back and record at a later date, you know, with Tony and Roy Young. When Epstein came on the scene, he annulled that pretty quickly, like, you know. But uh, that, be quite honest, that initial feeling of actually getting signed and actually having the record out, you know, my Bonnie uh, with Saints on the back, you know, even though we were anonymously called the Beat Brothers, right? <laughs> Not even the Beatles at that stage. But it was like, no, that's us, you know. So, of course, when we came back, you know, we were billed as Polydor recording artists, you know, record released by Bonnie, which was great for us, great for our egos, you know. Um, but it was just a fantastic feeling to know they had a record contract, you know, because nothing like that had happened to a band in Liverpool. So, for want of a better question, how does this man, Mr. Epstein, of Nem's music with his tailor made suits, mm -hmm. Find these leather scrap, leather clad scruffs. How does he find them? Right, um, that, that's there's conflicting stories about this, but the one which uh, I think most probably runs true to course is the fact that you know um, when my Bonnie came out and Bob Wooler, God bless his soul, had plugged the heart and soul out of it at the cabin. You know, dinner time sessions, evening sessions, Beatles release, come and get it at Nems, this, this, that, and the other. Um, so a guy called Ron Jones has apparently went down to see Epstein. Uh, or not to see Epstein, he went down and um, Epstein wasn't stuck in my bunny. And he basically turned around and said, have you got my bunny by the Beatles? You know, so Epstein turned around and said, who are the Beatles? So he said, God almighty, you don't know who the, the Beatles are. You know, they're playing 200 yards up the road to Matthew Street biggest crowd pullers in Liverpool, you don't know who they are. So he said, go and see them, you know, if you don't believe me. So Epstein, give him a due, right? His motto was that basically, there isn't a record I can't get. Tell me what it is. And he did. He tracked it down. It wasn't My Bonnie by the Beatles. It happened to be My Bonnie by Tony Sherrod and the Beat Brothers, okay? But it was us, okay? That rouse curiosity with him, right? The fact that this guy had basically come in and turned around and said, the Beatles, you know, Liverpool band with the recording contract, crowd pullers, cavern. He went down, watched us, stood in the shadows, watched us, and uh, became basically enchanted with the band. Okay, loved what he saw, and passed word to Bob Wooler that he'd like to see us. And of course, that was when he put the deal to us, you know. Um, we asked Bob, we asked, you know, Bob for some of his advice. 
we went back and asked our parents, you know, what do you think, this, this, that and the other. And it was like, well, yeah, fine, you know, go and see him. You know, you can't lose anything by that. Because by this time, Alan, God bless him, had sort of faded away from being our manager. I'd taken over the role of business bookings, if you could put it that way, arranging fees and all the other bits. Um, so it seemed a progressional thing to do, you know. Um, so the next day, uh, we went in to see Epstein. There he was, pinstripe suit, immaculate, you know. Uh, you know, in we walked, the Beatles, so of course we had to walk through NEMS and all the shop girls, the sales assistants are all like, oh, God, it's the Beatles, the Beatles, you know. So we swaggered through in our letters and all the other bits and pieces and we went up to the offices and he put the deal to us and he was very gentlemanly like, um, talk around the subject, he said, I've seen you, I've thought about it. Um, I've always wanted to do something in show business. Failed actor, right? And he basically turned around and said, uh, I'd like to manage you. But it's a two-way thing. He said, if you don't get on with me, no holds barred. Vice versa, I don't get on with you, no holds barred. He said, but if you're willing to take that chance, I'm willing to give it a go. We said he sounded fair, you know. We went away, we had a pint of the grapes. We said, we go back and chuck, chuck it over with our parents. You know, they said, well, fine, if it's what you want to do. Consensus of opinion was, yeah, we'll go with that. Of course, by this time, you know, it's four of us, Stu's, you know, falling in love with Astrid and, you know, that whole love story had evolved. Um, so we went back to see Epstein and basically turned around and said, unbeknownst to him, we basically sort of sat in the grapes and turned around and said, yeah, you know, Owns a record store, you know, drives a big Zodiac car. Money, money. Um, you know, he can do things for us. Um, so it was the, that was the motivation behind it, like, you know. No strings attached. We went back and turned around and said, we're unhappy. And that's when we put pen to paper, allegedly supposed to sign the first contract, which never got signed by Epstein. Uh, but then the second one was, okay, which is part of history now. And that's how he basically evolved as our manager. But it all be, all basically transpired, this chance meeting with Ron Jones, or Ray Jones, and uh, him coming down to the Casbah and being mesmerised by the Beatles, you know. Um, and it, it was, when you think about it, um, at that initial stage, a union of two completely different opposites. You know, we're leather-clad rockers, right? Totally inhibited, spitting, smoking, everything else on stage. He's very refined, dignified, you know, even in his manner talking to us. Um, but it worked. That was the incredible thing. But, you see, one of the first things we we set him, um, and we'd all agreed on this, was that... It was great having a recording contract in Germany with Polydor. But the logistics of it going back over to Germany to record, that could only happen if we went and played Germany again. Little did we know at that time we were going back to open the Star Club. And uh, it very much became, you know, we want a record company in England. So that's your task. And he took it on, you know, full-blown. Right, the first thing we knew, Mike Williams from Decca, the biggest record company in England at that time, is down in the cabin with the uh, Epi. Right, loves the band, you know. Um, auditions arranged for Jan One Sixty Two in Decca, you know. And I was like, God, this guy works miracles, you know. And of course, the, the alleged, you know, infamous Decca auditions. <laughs> Um, where we thought we got it, um, but we found out afterwards we didn't. Um, but that was the start of it all. That was, I mean, that was the the endeavour. Um, I mean, there was dismay for us because we hadn't got Decker. Um, but that's another story. Um, we know the story behind it now. We know why, you know, Mike Smith never signed us. He had, you know, uh, Brian Tremolo and the, you know, Brian Poole and the Tremolos and the Wings which he openly admitted to us many, many years afterwards, you know, which was great, okay. You know, why didn't you say that at the time? 
Um, but it, it, it sort of, uh, because of that and the disappointments, I think it gave Epi a bit more incentive, a bit more determination, you know. Because um, we honestly thought, we went out and celebrated in St. John's Wood, some posh restaurants, Epi bought the dinner, it was like wine, drinking wine, champagne, this, that and the other. Oh, Decker, put pen to paper, right? You know, boom, you know, the knockback came. And uh, he, you know, took the Decker audition tapes and kind of made them into reel to reel. And he basically flogged, you know, all the records companies in in London. And he was getting that desperate because they were getting turned down, right? And he was getting that desperate. He was thinking of signing us to Embassy, which is the record label that Woolies used to run, you know. But any port in a storm, so to speak. Uh, but then the lifeline came from Parlophone. Um, and, uh, you know... Uh, as history portrays now, you know, we went down, we auditioned, George Martin was there. Say la vie. Although Beatlemania worldwide was a way away, would it be fair to say at this time around the time of auditioning, and certainly before auditioning for George Martin, in this city you were the number one man, weren't you? Oh yeah, without doubt. Um, we had contenders. Um, people who chased us. Um, we had our own choice as regards our own personal bands who we liked, you know, King Size Tail and the Domino. Um, that to us was, I suppose, a musician's band. You know, that if we wanted to go and see a band, that was King Size, you know. Um, but others were chasing us, you know, Storm, Rory Storm, God bless him, uh, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Remo 4. Well, big followers, okay, but when it came to actually filling dance halls and you know filling the cabin queues outside the cabin you know you put the Beatles on no matter where they were you know you had this myriads of fans which just flocked there okay it was just like a magnet you know the Beatles were a magnet for for birds you know girls and fellas I'd, I'd like but you know if a promoter put the Beatles on Mo included you know she she had her own uh, you know she had her own hold sessions, put the Beatles on, you know, um, so that uh, she could contend with other promoters in Liverpool. Just a, a magnet, you know, Beatles were on the bill, you were guaranteed instant success, you know, and uh, they kept that, they kept that intact basically up till when they left Liverpool, you know, which was after my demise anyway. So you've been down to audition for George Martin, mm -hmm. Parlophone. When do you, when are you actually told the the news that you're no longer going to be a Beatle? I was told we auditioned. Um, well, there's a controversy over this, to be quite honest. Okay. Um, there's one camp which turns around and says that a record contract was signed when I was played when we went down. It was classed as an audition, but a record contract had been signed. And there's another camp which turns around and said, no, it was an audition and then the record contract was signed afterwards. Okay. Which side you lie on is up to personal choice. Okay. And which evidence you seek out and which you believe and which you don't believe. Apparently what happened was at that particular um, Appearance at the MI Studios, okay. Um, when we were, came down to show George Martin um, our own material. Because what had happened in the meantime, when we knew that, and this this is again adds to the, the theory that we already signed a contract, right? George Martin was sending material down to us, okay, um, which he wanted us to record. Now, why would he do that with an audition band? Okay, I leave that question intact. Okay, um, and of course we didn't like it, and we were doing our own original material by this time. So it was like, no, we'd come down and, you know, um, the tracks that we wanted to play were Love Me Do, P.S. I Love You, Ask Me Why, and, you know, a great version of Besame Mucho. And we left that particular road appearance <laughs> um, or recording okay and uh, we were under the 
assumption that we are going to go back to put the finishing touches to it. Hence another little key as to the fact the contract had been signed, even though it was denied many years afterwards. Um, but at that stage, there'd be no mention at all about the fact that E.G. George Martin or someone in the company that had been at that appearance, you know, uh, when we were playing, dropping those tracks down. Um, there hadn't been any mention at all, not to me anyway. There'd, there'd been, you know, mixed feelings about me drumming. And what I did realise was that because I had such a big drum sound, okay, um, it most probably that first time, you know, a lot of bass drum, a lot of tom tom work, etc., etc., etc. It may have given them problems, you know, to get that sound on stage. Or, or sorry, on record. What was said, I don't know, I wasn't there, okay, but the hindsight of it was that basically um, in August we were supposed to go back to put the finishing touches to it in October. September, October. And uh, in August, around about the 15th of August, I was called into Brian Epstein's office, played the night before the cabin. Um, asked John whether he wanted to lift home. Neil was the roadie at that time. And, uh, you know, rather strange because John normally jumped in the van and went back to my place, so we dropped him off at, you know, Aunt Mimi's. And uh, he said, no, um, I'll, I'll, I'll make me own my own. You know, I don't know more about it. Um, Epstein wanted to see me the following morning. And I thought no more about that because I'd had business meetings with Epstein. He was green as regards the business, green as regards promoters. So he used to basically pick my brains. You know, anything where he had a query about, he'd basically turn around and say, Pete, what's this promoter like? You know, what's the price we should ask? Should we up the money, this, that, and the other? And I just thought, no decision like that, you know. And uh, when I got there, um, and I got into the office, um, I suppose that's when I became a little apprehensive about what was going to happen, okay, because Brian wasn't his normal cool, calm, plus itself, you know, not like, oh, you Pete, come in, you know, have a coffee, this type of stuff. He was very reticent, you know, um, and uh, he'd basically talk around the subject for a while and then turn around very apologetically, I suppose that's the word, turn around and said, Pete, he said, uh, I have bad news for you. He said, uh, the boys want you out. And uh, it's been arranged that Ringo will join the band on Saturday. And of course, that was the bombshell because I'd had no forewarning at all about this. All this had been going on behind closed doors. <coughs> and um, at that stage, because of, you know, I suppose you turn around and say you're shell shocked, you know. I was trying to think, you know, what have I done wrong? You know, what, what's the reason for it? And it you know, you basically turn around and say, well, they feel Ringo's a better drummer. And as I was turned around and said, that was a matter of opinion, because I was rated along with Johnny Hutch <coughs> to be one of the, you know, top drummers in Liverpool. But again, that's food for thought. Um, and everyone has their own opinion about that. You know, so I went away. And it was only when I got back home to Mona and I explained the situation to Mona, um, the reality of the situation hit me. Because what I'd agreed to was that I would play two gigs before Ringo joined the band on Saturday. One at Chester Ballroom and um, somewhere else. Okay, details, it you know, doesn't make anything at the moment. Um, but when the reality of the situation hit me um, and I got home, I, to be honest, I cried. I broke down, you know, I'd two years of my life into this band and basically on the cusp of just you know first record release which we hoped was going to do great for us it was snatched from me and um mo turned around and said well i'm not happy with that you know i'm not happy with the you know the reason so she talked to tried to talk to epstein epstein wouldn't answer the phone which was fair comments you know um, we didn't know what mo was gonna you know lay into him about or ask him about. So she took the bull by the horns and she spoke to George Martin. 
and George Martin is alleged to have said that I didn't say anything about people being replaced in the band. And I think that became evident because when I didn't go back and Ringo was there, Martin turned down and said, where's Pete? And that's when he was told Pete's left and Ringo's replaced him. Which meant that when Mo spoke to him, um, he turned around and said, there'd been no mention about that. He said, basically what we'd intimated because of Pete's drumming and the sound, we were used to session men, which had just come in, the economics of the situation, play what we wanted, knew exactly how to record them. They were in and out, okay? And uh, he said, that's what we, we meant, okay? Till we adopted Pete's style, you know, which was a two-way thing. We adopted to Pete's sound and he adopted to the way we wanted to record it, etc., et or what we could record. Um, so there was a compromise. He said we'd use the session drummer, right? Um, but don't affect the image, okay? There's no need to replace Pete. He said because I knew what a focal point and how important Pete was to the band, you know? Um, he said, but somewhere in transcript that's been taken out of context. And, you know, it's been used that I wasn't a good enough drummer, hence Ringo's come in. Hence you get all the grey area and the analogies and the enigmas and all the stories evolve. Um, but that's apparently what George Martin said. If we go fast forward now to the 90s, mm. <coughs> Pete Best, that original drummer the Beatles had, that helped build their following in this city and in Hamburg, yeah, yeah. suddenly appears on a Beatles album. Cool Anthology Volume 1. <laughs> How did that feel for you? Total shock, to be quite honest. Um, I mean, in hindsight, people are most probably going to turn around and say, oh, blase about that, like, you know, um, because I never thought it was going to happen. There had been so many projects which the Beatles had done, the BBC tapes, record releases, old, you know, stuff all over the world, which, you know, you could have been on, but you weren't. You know, uh, not by my choice. You know, it was like, no, it could have earned a few more bob off that as well. But, you know, it never happened. So there were rumours, yeah, you know, that they're, they're going to play some of the, the old stuff. And it was like, yeah, fine. You know, it was another one of those, yeah, if it happens, it happens, you know. Um, <coughs> but it became a little bit more realistic um, when I got a phone call from Neil. It was by this time, was in, you know, head shebang at Apple, like, you know. And, uh, you know, we'd remained friends over the years. Um, you know, business didn't come into it. Um, you know, he didn't talk business, I didn't talk business. We were just mates. And he phoned me and he turned around and said, Pete, um, he said, they are thinking about using some of your old material on the anthology, Anthology 1. And uh, how do you feel about that? So I said, well, fine, I've got no qualms about it. Um, so he said, okay, he said, the number of tracks at this stage, he said, it might be one, he said, it might be ten, it might be two. He said, we don't know. He said, the final decision hasn't been made on it. Um, so at, at that stage, he turned around and said, you will get an offer from Apple. Okay, the offer from Apple came. We'd have been um, Apple, um, I needed lawyers to look at it, right? Legal lawyers, um, they battered out a case with, with Apple. And uh, it ended up um, that it was on, I think, seven or eight tracks with Apple. Um, my Bonnie. And uh, it was great. After God knows how many years, 62 to well, 1990, or 94, 95, um, you know, I got some royalties from work I'd done with the Beatles. Total surprise, um, but a very, a very much appreciated surprise. Okay, um, because because of that gesture from them, and the recognition they gave me. I think out of what sixty tracks on the album or something like that. I'm, you know, don't quote me because there's anoraks out there who'll turn around and say, no, it wasn't. It was so many tracks. <coughs> you know, being on about nine or ten tracks out of anthology one was, you know pretty good slice for me to, you know, lay my claim for the work I'd done with them. 
And uh, it was nice, you know, it was even nicer when I realised the first royalty cheque bounced on the floor and, you know, the sum of money that I was getting because it, it basically, even though I was comfortable, you know, I'd worked hard, uh, you know, um, you know, done my own thing, you know, provided for my family, you know, very proud of the fact that you'd, you know, bought your own house and all this type of stuff and raised a family without my kids even knowing for a very, very long time who I was, okay, till they went to school and then that, that's another story. Um, you know, then it was because of school kids asking them, is your dad Peter used to blah, blah, and it was like, they came back and asked me and then it was time to tell them. But, you know, I've never been one to sit down and say, you know, do you know who I am? Um, so, yeah, it was, we were comfortable. But, you know, with the, the royalties which accrued from the, the anthology one, it put me in a safe zone. Okay, so, you know, I say thank you very much for that opportunity. Pete, my final question. We're now sat here, it's going to be... 2017 next year, 50 years since Sergeant Pepper. Yeah. There are five generations or more of kids and adults yeah. who have praised and loved and worshipped this band that you were very much a part of. How does it feel to know that something that started at your mother's coffee bar in 1959 <laughs> is still worth sitting in a hotel room in 2016 in Liverpool and talking about? Well, to be quite honest with you, you've asked me 50 years ago and I turned around and said, no. <laughs> um, I suppose that's the incredible myth of the Beatles, um, the legend of the Beatles. I mean, there's, there's generations, each generation. What transpired rocked the whole record business, the show business, right? To be part of that. No matter what perspective you put on it or what contribution you made or whatever history portrays contribution you made, okay, it, it's very flattering to realise that you were part of that band. Even though you don't wear it on your hat and, you know, carry a slogan turning around and saying, you know, who I am. Um, but I think they conquered so many boundaries and I think people, generations have always turned around and said, it will get past its sell-by date. And another generation comes along and rediscovers the music. Another generation comes along and rediscovers as you just turned around and said, five generations. My God, it's a hell of a, a hell of a legacy they've left, isn't it? And I've no doubt, um, even when we're no longer on the planet, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if another five generations, you know, from next year, you know, so now you're talking late 21st century, you know, could still have the same respect and euphoria for an album. You know, it, it's... It's it's an album which has gone down in history as most probably their greatest album. People have reservations about it. They all have the personal choices. But the even to this day, the charisma and the excitement that the name Beatles creates, not just in Liverpool, worldwide, no matter where you go, Mexico, South America, Japan, Germany, you name it, you know, a little island in Samoa somewhere. You know, you mentioned Beatles and it's it's the euphoria. That is, I mean, that's the legacy they've left, you know, and whether anyone will ever top that legacy, God only knows. But it's a hell of a legacy, you know, and it's wonderful for me to have been a small part of that. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much,